Hey guys, what's up? Lewin here at GarageBand and beyond. Welcome back. Hey, don't forget, if you're trying to build a home recording studio and you have no idea what to buy, check out my link for garagebandandbeyond.com below and uh, go find the home recording studio shoppers list, an itemized list of everything you need for your very first home recording studio. Uh, so that's it. So why am I here today? Because I'm answering a Facebook request finally. Uh, any of you who aren't on my Facebook page, go find it. If you have questions, it's the best way to ans uh, ask them because I answer those questions as quickly as possible. I get tons of them, so sorry if I'm a little slow sometimes. Um, anyway, Ruben, dude, I'm going to answer your question. So Ruben, uh, really quickly, I'll just tell you guys, Ruben was kind enough to come see me play when I was in Italy. He was on vacation with his family at the time. And I was playing in Tuscany and he came to a show. So I thought it'd be nice to return the favor and answer his uh, Facebook request for a tutorial on how to mix drums and bass. So that's what we're doing. Let's talk about it immediately. So here's something that I did today specifically for this video. It's nothing in particular. I just sort of invented it on the spot using, uh, you know, just regular GarageBand loop. Uh, and uh, my old Epiphone bass going into my audio box and using the Studio Direct Box Warm setting in GarageBand, one of my favorites. Uh, here's what it sounds like 100% natural. This is completely untreated. Right, nice and easy. Here is the one that's all treated. Simple and very different. Um, you know, this was just sort of a tone I went with today, but the process that I'm going to take you through is the way that I find bass and drum tones all the time. So if, you know, even if you don't like the bass tone I came up with for this little thing, you can still take the method I'm going to show you and, you know, probably come up with a tone you like all by yourself. So first place I start with any mix is the drums. Uh, you know, as GarageBand people, you know, we're using loops a lot. We're using MIDI tracks a lot. So you have very limited control over those things. Um, so being that that's the channel that has the least amount of control, really, um, I make sure that it's the one that I'm really keeping my eye on the most. Um, meaning as I add in on other instruments, the bass guitar, regular electric guitars, pianos and voices and stuff, as I'm adding those and dealing with the mix, I'm constantly listening for the kick drum, the snare drum, the hi-hat, all the drums, you know? and making sure that whatever I'm adding in is not interfering with the drums uh, in EQ or volume or anything like that. Um, so, okay, so that's that. So, you know, I also like to recommend that you do not compress or EQ any of these loops. In most cases, these things have been expertly recorded. And, you know, if you're gonna double compress it, you know, or if you're gonna add a compressor on there, you're gonna be double compressing. You're gonna add an EQ, double, sometimes triple EQing. Not really a good idea. I know in the past I've made videos where I've done that and that's just because I wanted a different sound out of those drums. So I threw a compressor or something on there to get what I wanted out of it. But in most cases, I think these things are really well recorded. So it's better to just leave them alone. Um, so now, like I'm saying, I focus on the drum parts intently because wherever the kick drum and the bass you know, wherever they line up in the song, they should line up as cleanly as possible. Um, this is something that, you know, hopefully your bass player is really, really accurate and, you know, you don't have to do a lot of editing. Um, but those two elements, the kick drum and the bass guitar, when those, when those two line up nicely in a song, it is, it, they support each other, they help the overall tone, they just really help define that, that rhythm part, you know? Bass and drums are rhythm instruments and you really, you know, they really should line up as much as possible. This is my personal preference. Um, so let's talk about, you know, that a little bit. So let's listen to the one that is untreated. And let's look at it. Right. So there's one right back here, this one right here. Um, so. What I'll do, you know, like I, I've shown you guys in the past, well, maybe it wasn't that one, I guess. Uh, let's see, maybe this one here. Let's look at this one. Okay, so what I'm gonna be doing here is I'm looking for the kick drum in this pattern. So in this case, it's all, all the really big peaks here are kick drums. 
Um, so this is the kick drum that I'm looking for. Are, can you hear that guy outside with a lawnmower or whatever it is? It's so awesome. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so as you can see, I didn't play right on time. So what I, you know, I've talked about editing before. I just grab this with the editor and I'll bring it, you know, up to the line. And remember, this is very important. There's a beginning, a peak and a decay, you know, so, uh, or an attack, a peak and a decay of any sound. So, you know, I'm going to line it up with the peak with the line here, <laughs> the cursor, that's the word. And I'll do the same thing here. I'll try to line this waveform up with its peak and I'm going to have some stuff up in front of the cursor. Uh, that's usually, you know, like finger noise or, you know, the, just the very beginning of that sound, whatever it is. Um, so anyway, so going around and going through your bass part uh, and lining up the kick drum and the bass guitar wherever they should be lining up, lining those up nice and tight is definitely a good idea. It They just support each other and they help each other punch through the kick drum and the bass um, through any mix. If you get those nice and lined up, they will punch through, trust me. Now, uh, I'm just gonna go up here, show you the one, the rest of what I've done. So. Now what I usually start with uh, is the bass amp and I go in and I just get the tone I want. In this particular case, you know, uh, I put the low setting down at 4.6. I had to bring it out a lot, actually. I thought that the tone was just muddy and I didn't really like it over those drums. Um, one trick that I use a lot uh, for mid frequencies on lots of different instruments like guitars and voices and basses and stuff. Um, one of the things, you know, when I'm working with mids, this is something I always go to first and which is taking the regular mid control and putting it a little bit above 12 o'clock and then taking that mid frequency sweep control and then, you know, moving it in the opposite direction. So as you can see, you know, this is above 12 o'clock at 6.5 and now, you know, this is down below 12 o'clock at 400 hertz. You know, this is, you know, just sort of like a regular parameter that I like to use and I'll, I'll go to it and then I'll, you know, fiddle with it and get it nice and tweaked out however I like it. Um, but that's a good place to start, a little bit above and a little bit below. Uh, then the high, you know, almost dead center. One thing I did sort of want out of this bass tone that I created was a little bit of a grind to it. Um, so I sort of worked the pre-gain here a little bit hotter than most people do, I guess. Um, but if this is the tone you like, this is what I did. Uh, so brought the output level down a little bit and brought the pre-gain level up quite a bit. Um, that just works its little virtual preamp and you get a little little distortion out of it. It just helps it get a little crunchy and it's cool sounding. Um, next thing I always add on in you know, most cases is the bass, redu bass reduction. And uh, you know I've talked about this in the past, just shave off enough of the low end where you know the kick drum is actually you know the low man on the totem pole, so to speak. So whatever, you know, the lowest frequencies of the kick drum are, they're allowed to act all on their own with no bass guitar tone interfering. Using something like the bass reduction eliminates all those, you know, tones that you really don't need out of a bass guitar that just sort of end up muddying up a mix. And if you do remove that, you get a nice more defined bass guitar tone. Uh, and I'll just, let me run you through this on and off because it's really subtle what I do. So let's just listen to it. Here's it on. I'm going to turn it on and off as I play. So hopefully you can hear it. Off. Right. Super, super subtle, but definitely noticeable. Um, if you have headphones or, you know, that's always a good way to listen to my videos and always please listen to the HD versions of my videos because I do provide them in HD. And that's how you're going to get the best audio quality. Um, now, so I've shaved off, you know, a lot of the low end here in the bass amp. I shaved off more bass in the bass reduction thing. Um, and the last thing that I usually do is I'll go to the compressor and squeeze everything I've done. Now using the compressor will affect the overall tone. And in this case, what it'll actually do, especially the way I have it set up right now, um, is we'll actually bring in a little, little bit of those lower frequencies that I just actually cut away with the bass reducer and the bass amp controls and all that. I actually got rid of a lot of that stuff, but the compressor is going to add it back in less of it than was there before, but it's gonna what it is going to add in will be controlled and tamed 
by the compressor. So it really should, in theory, not interfere with that kick drum sound. Um, you know, so, you know, again, you're going to have to experiment on your own, but here are my settings for this particular thing. Negative 21 dB on the threshold, on the ratio. I have it at a ratio of 11 dB to 1. Uh, the attack is nice and fast, 5.5 milliseconds, and then the gain is set almost dead, dead center, 4.0 dB. Um, so, you know, basic thing, but I mean, on and off, let's do one of those for you here. So this is with it on. Off. Right. So, you know, it's a combination of, you know, these three different components um, that I have, the, the bass reducer, the bass amp setting and the compressor. And, you know, like I said, I shave off all that stuff and then I add the compressor in at the end. I think it's important and every engineer has their own process, but I like adding in the compressor at the end because I know that it's going to be, you know, it's going to, you know, add a lot of the stuff that I just got rid of. So then um, but in a controlled manner, so it's easier to deal with. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's what I do. And it's, you know, simple thing. It's going to be, you know, really trusting your ears, um, but definitely focusing on the kick drum and the bass parts, you know, wherever they align, you want them to be nice and tight. And, um, and that's it. Just don't let them interfere with each other and that you should be fine with. All right, you guys, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Ruben, thanks for the request, man. Uh, hope you're doing well. Later guys.